Hi and welcome. My name is Dominic. I'm one of the founders of Duende Software, which is the, the company that produces Identity Server. And we do regular trainings and workshops at conferences online and for customers. And um, this video here, the introduction to the ASP.NET Core authentication and authorization system is part of our two day or three day training. So this is an excerpt of that, uh, a shortened version, if you like, um, because we are often getting questions about how these things work and, and work together. And we thought it's you know very useful to have a, a, a standalone recording of that. So um, you can learn about the basics of this um, pretty important piece of ASP.NET Core, which is the authentication and authorization subsystem, if you like. So let's get started. Okay, so generally I assume that you know how ASP.NET Core works, uh, but just to make sure we are all on a separate, uh, on the same page, um, what you're seeing on the screen is basically ASP.NET Core in a nutshell, meaning you have a hosting process that runs your application. You started um, .NET Core, you know, via .NET Run or via invoking um, um, the, your, your uh, executable. And this one then loads ASP.NET Core as, you know, which is just a bunch of NuGet packages. And ASP.NET Core has a bunch of, of building blocks. First of all, it has basically a, a runtime server component. And the job of the server component is to basically uh, listen for incoming HTTP traffic and at the border uh, here at the edge, turn this incoming traffic into an HTTP context object. Um, basically a .NET representation of that incoming request. And then a very important uh, component here is, uh, is basically called middleware, which are basically functions that, that look at the incoming request, can transform and inspect that request, and can then uh, typically forward that to the next middleware and to the next middleware until we finally reach this thing called endpoints at the end, which is also middleware, but a special type of middleware where typically your business logic would be running. These are the endpoints in your system, like a Razor page or an MVC controller or an API controller or something like this that would then ultimately produce the response, which then gets passed back again through the middleware chain until it reaches um, the edge again, where then the server then basically turns that HTTP context back into an HTTP response. Yeah. Um, the other thing that is important to know is that basically all of the real functionality lives in, a, in, in the dependency injection container and the DI container. So the middlewares typically themselves don't have that much logic. They're draw, you know, pulling that logic from, a, from the DI container. This is also how you typically customize ASP.NET by um, either replacing services in, in the DI container or uh, uh, customizing them, subclassing them whatever, so, so that those standard middlewares will use the, the modified behavior. Um, and the other very important um, uh, piece of the puzzle here is, is that endpoints basically um, uh, contain what we call metadata. So that this is especially important in, in, in the security um, uh, um, you know, space where you can uh, attach certain security requirements to pages or endpoints in your application um, and the middleware is then responsible for fulfilling those requirements. That's basically it, okay? Um, so let's have a quick look at a, a very simple ASP.NET Core application. So you can see that's our, our program CS, our entry point here. That's where we create the application, the upper part is where we populate the, the, the DI container. In this case, we're just adding support for Razor pages. Then we are creating that application host, if you like. And then here we are adding a, um, a bunch of middlewares to it, one for serving static files and one is for basically um, the, the, the routing middleware is responsible for um, turning the incoming URLs into uh, endpoints that can be invoked. And then here the map Razor pages is actually uh, populating those endpoints with all the pages we have in our system and then finally we're running the application. Okay, so if I would run that, no, no surprises here, this pretty much looks like, you know, the standard um, uh, ASP.NET Core template that ships with the product. Okay, um, so one of these pages is called secure 
And um, the special thing about the secure page is, is that it has this authorize attribute um, on top. And I mentioned metadata earlier, and one of the metadata uh, that ASP.NET Core has is the authorization metadata, which means you can annotate endpoints in the system and attach certain security requirements to them. One of the most basic security requirements would be uh, saying you need to be authenticated before you can access this page. Okay, And this is expressed by um, the authorize attribute. There are multiple ways of attaching um, authorization metadata to endpoints. Uh, a very commonly used one is the authorize attribute, where this allows you to do like a page by page uh, thing. Um, you can also attach the authorization metadata directly here, um, which means that all of the Razor pages would now require authorization or uh, an authenticated user. So there are multiple ways of doing that, but ultimately, uh, regardless which approach you're using is um, that when the, the, um, the, the internal routing table gets built, this authorization requirements gets uh, assigned to this particular endpoint or all the endpoints or multiple endpoints and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, I, I'm mentioning this because if you're coming from older versions of MVC or ASP.NET, you maybe remember that the authorize attribute was actually something called an action filter, where all of the authorization logic was inside of that filter. This is not the case anymore. The authorize attribute itself has no code whatsoever in it. It's just a marker interface that, as I said, populates the metadata that belongs to this particular endpoint. Okay, so let's run, or actually, uh, let's, let's try to invoke this um, secure endpoint and what you will see is that you will get an exception. Basically what the exception is saying is that the slash secure endpoint contains authorization metadata but we haven't found a middleware that was um, that is processing that requirement and they say like you should actually call app.use authorization in your application startup code. Okay and they're also telling you that it must become uh, it must come between or after use the routing because that's where the actual um, URL is matched to the endpoint and but before the actual endpoints are being registered. Okay, so going back to our sample that would be between here and and here. Okay, so if we rerun the application now again we will actually have the authorization middleware in the pipeline. It will inspect the endpoint. It will figure out, hey, this needs authentication. So what do we do? Let's try. And you will see, we're getting another exception. Unlike the first exception, this one is not as descriptive. Um, uh, uh, basically, you can tell that there was a developer writing the exception text and for, for, that, for that developer it was totally clear what that means. But if you are new to the authentication system in ASP.NET Core, then probably you don't know what it means. He talks about authentication schemes and default challenge schemes and add authentication and, and all kinds of things that we don't know what that means. So let's actually go back to the slides and for a moment um, have a look at, at some, some background information here. So um, authentication is not trivial. Uh, and the authentication subsystem in ASP.NET Core is also, you know, not super easy. And the, the reason for that is, I guess, because the, the problem is not super easy. Yeah. Um, if you come from earlier versions of ASP.NET, like uh, on .NET Framework, you probably remember that the world was a little bit simpler, right? You basically had two choices. You, you, you went to webconfig and said mode is equals forms or windows. Or, or none, right? These were basically your choices, which meant if you do forms authentication, you chose forms. If you do Windows authentication, you chose Windows. If you want to do both of them, ah, you're out of luck. If you want to do something else, you had to basically go to none and then re-implement the whole thing from scratch. That was not really flexible. Yeah? Um, so one of the design goals of ASP.NET Core was to make this much, much better, much more flexible and uh, much more powerful and one of the things that was a design goal was is that you should be able to mix and match any authentication method you like 
in a single ASP.NET Core application and they should you know, peacefully coexist. And that is, as I said, not trivial because different authentication methods use different mechanisms, right? Some use a cookie, some use a redirect based thing, some use a challenge and response based thing, some expect certain headers to be set, right? So there needed to be some sort of abstraction um, to make this happen, okay? And, um, and the authentication subsystem doesn't have an official name or something, but I, in my mind, it's, it's a micro framework within the ASP.NET Core framework. And it, you know, has all the things that make a framework. Uh, it has base classes that you can derive from and services that you can uh, create or customize. And there's configuration plumbing and, and APIs that you can use to, um, to program against this framework and so on. Yeah. Um, so basically, the, the, the goal of, of this video is that, that you learn about all of these building blocks um, and, uh, and you know, know how to, how, to, how to use them and, and especially how they work together. Yeah? Um, the first building block, the most basic building block that makes up this framework is what is called authentication handlers. So think of an authentication handler is basically an, an, um, an implementation of a specific authentication method. So, um, you, know, you know, for example, um, we have, uh, you know, very often your authentication, uh, the authentication you're building for um, an ASP.NET Core application uh, consists of basically going to a login page, setting a cookie, and as long as this cookie is present, the user is authenticated, and when the cookie gets deleted, the user is un unauthentic or anonymous again, right? So for this type of authentication, there is one handler called the cookie authentication handler, which implements exactly this. Yeah? Um, session management in, in, in terms of um, you know, starting and stopping a session and being able to um, persist and round trip the user's identity as part of that cookie. So that's one authentication handler. Another class um, of, of uh, authentication handlers deals with systems where your application and the authentication system are two different applications, right? So for example, if you want to add uh, Google uh, authentication support or Facebook authentication support or whatever, um, you know, th this works fundamentally different because in this case, the user is sent to a different server and then this server does the authentication and sends back some information back to your application that you can validate, right? These are called remote authentication handlers, and we're not going to talk about them in this video, at least. Um, but there are two buckets, just, just so, so you know, there are the ones which I call proprietary, like, as I said, Google, Facebook, and there are like 50 plus others that you can download from, from, a, from a community project on GitHub. And there are the standards-based um, remote authentication handlers for, you know, the, the big three protocols, OpenID Connect, WS Federation, and SAML. Yeah? And the last type of, of authentication handler, which is commonly used, is uh, for API uh, authentication, which basically often, you know, um, works in a way that the client sends some token, typically a JSON web token, on a header to an API, and then the API is validating the token, and that's the authentication bit. Okay. So for all of these different authentication methods, there is one handler for each. Okay. So, so that, that that's the idea. Uh, you have one handler implementing exactly one authentication method, and then you can basically compose these handlers together in your in your application so that you have support for all of the authentication methods you need. Now the way this works is basically is is that when you are starting up the application, you putting all, you're putting all of these handlers into the DI container. So basically you say services.add authentication, which adds the basic authentication plumbing to DI. And then you have like a fluent API that you can say, okay, add cookies and add Google and add OpenID Connect and add SAML and you know, what have you, right? Um, so that is basically um, just a, a nice syntactic sugar around putting these handlers into the DI container. Now, there are a couple of important things here. Um, as I said, you can put as many handlers into the DI container there, but there's one requirement, and that requirement is, is that every handler must have a unique name, okay? Uh, and that is what Microsoft calls an authentication scheme, or short, just a scheme, okay? So you, when, when you are adding these handlers to the DI container, you have to make sure that every handler get, gets a unique name. And uh, there is also a concept of what is the default authentication scheme of the application. 
Um, and that is basically to say like you can always invoke handlers explicitly by name and if you omit the name that then the assumption is you're just using whatever is the default authentication mechanism and that is you know reducing um, the tight coupling inside your application. So, so that's one building block and if you now look at that um, the exception method makes a little bit more sense, right? It says there is no authentication scheme specified. So we, we, we don't have a, a handler here, which is taking care of authentication. Um, and add authentication is missing as well, right? So that's basically um, what this um, exception message, uh, message is trying, trying to tell you, okay? So, so that's that. So we're gonna fix this in a second and the, the second fundamental building block is, is the authentication middleware. So the upper part here, all it does is really just put stuff into your DI container. Someone has to invoke that stuff, okay? Um, and we've seen two, uh, well, so far we've seen one, one um, reason to invoke a handler and that is because access is denied. So somehow some, someone needs to take care of sending that user now to a login page, for example. Who is doing that, right? We're gonna have a look at that in a second in much more detail. And also once the user is authenticated, who is then, who, who, who is then responsible for looking at this cookie, for example, and turning it back into a user object, right? So um, whenever some, something has to be or get invoked automatically as part of a request or a response in ASP.NET, there is some middleware involved, yeah? And that is exactly the job of the authentication middleware. So the authentication middleware uses whatever authentication handler is configured to be the default to authenticate an incoming user. Again, this is uh, um, something we have to, you know, play around with to fully understand how this works. But let's start by fixing our application. So. Let's do this. We go here and say builder.services.add authentication. Okay? Um, and then, as I said, um, the idea is, is then that every authentication handler adds an extension method to this, um, to this uh, builder object coming back here. And for example, we can now say add cookie. Okay? And as I said, if you would if we would pull in more NuGet packages for Google and whatever, then all of these extension methods would show up here, and that would be you know the way how we can compose our authentication methods. But let's start simple. Um, the first step always is what I at least do is I give every handler a name. Now it turns out the cookie handler, if you omit that name or scheme parameter, they have a built-in one, which is called cookie or cookies. And you see, I can't remember is it cookie or cookies. Um, and since I don't, I, I don't want to, you know, need to remember these things, and I and I like to be ex explicit about my code, I always pass in the name explicitly here. And this thing is called cookie. Yeah. And then the second um, design pattern, if you like, is that the second parameter is always an action of T, where the T is basically a, an options object, and on this options object, you can now set cookie authentication specific configuration options. Okay. Um, for example, I mean, as you would expect, I can do something like cookie.name, right? So what, um, what should be the name of that cookie that gets dropped by the cookie authentication handler? Let's call it demo, yeah? Um, things like uh, exp expire time span, right? Like how, how long should this cookie live uh, by, by default? Yeah, so you can say, you know, time span from, you know, I don't know, from hours eight, right? So that's a typical, you know, one working day kind of scenario. And then you can say, should this cookie automatically slide or should, should, should it be like an absolute expiration cookie that in exactly eight hours the user has to re-authenticate because the cookie will be invalid and the session is over, right? All, all of these things um, can be defined here. Uh, another thing is um, when we go back here, right, um, this exception says like, um, there is no default challenge scheme found. And what Microsoft means with challenge is uh, give the user a way to fix the problem, right? In this case, the user is anonymous. Uh, to fix the problem, the user could log on, right? Um, so the challenge would in that particular case mean send the user to a, a local login page in my application so that we can authenticate the user and then come back and try again, yeah? Um, to facilitate this, um, the cookie handler also has basically the, the, the concept of 
um, redirecting users to login pages, right? And there's a thing called the login path here. So that's where our login page lives. And I already prepared a really basic login page, which lives in account slash login, right? Which we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, right. Um, I think that's good for now. Uh, one important thing to know is um, the way ASP.NET Core works up until version seven at least is that even if you have only one handler registered in the DI system, you still need to specify the name of the default handler that you want to use. Um, in ASP.NET Core version seven, this has been changed in, in the sense of that if there is only one handler registered, then the default scheme will implicitly the name of this one handler, which makes sense. Uh, again, I am a fan of being explicit, so I will leave it like this. Um, cool. So, and then, um, you know, the, 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 the other thing um, that we have to do is, is enable the um, authentication middleware. Now, in the middleware pipeline, as you've seen on that slide, think of it as a linked list of middlewares, right? So the, the first one comes first, the second one comes second, you know, and so on. Meaning, ordering is important. So, of course, before we can do any authentic uh, authorization based on who the user is, we first need to authenticate that user, right? So make sure that the authentication middleware comes before the authorization middleware in that pipeline. Cool. So now let's um, run the application again. See, see what, what's changing now. Okay, so here we are. We click on the secure link and this time the, um, the request comes in, right? Um, the authorization middleware inspects the endpoint. It sees that there is an authorization requirement uh, attached to the secure page. The user is anonymous. It basically challenges the user, which you know means in our case, um, the cookie handler will redirect um, the user to the login page. Okay, so that's basically what we achieved with this configuration. Also, what happens during the redirect is, is that um, here uh, a return URL query string gets attached to the URL so that on the login page we know where the user wanted to go in the first place so we can redirect them back after successful authentication. Okay, so, so the next thing would be to, um, to uh, um, implement the login page. So the login page, you know, is pretty basic. We have a name and a password, as you've seen, meaning that we have our postback method here, which sends us back the name and the password of the user. Then here in these two lines of code, right, you normally would go to your database and validate the, the user password and so on, right? And if we are in this branch of our if statement, the user is valid, okay? So that means now, our job is here now to sign in that user or in other words, start um, a session for that user. Now the way uh, you sign in users in ASP.NET Core is, um, is by basically creating, uh, a, 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 you know, but basically creating an identity for that user and that, that, that's expressed in, in claims, yeah? And um, the most fundamental claim that you wanna set is what is what is typically called the subject identifier, which is the unique identifier for that user, right? And um, the properties of a subject identifier is is that it's um, it's uh, basically a, a unique ID. It is immutable and it's never going to be reused. Okay, so like a unique value, typically a GUID, right? That's the best subject ID that you can come up with. We we don't have a GUID right now, so let's just assume you know it's some. Um, some value uh, coming from our user store. Now, strictly speaking, for many situations, that's the only claim you need, right? Because that is the only, that claim, that, that knowledge of that subject ID allows you to go back to your database and fetch arbitrary other data about that user. Um, very often you're adding a little bit more to the session because you know certain information is needed on almost every page. And if you know you need this information everywhere, right, then um, maybe you wanna uh, leverage the session mechanism to cache that data. For example, let's say you want to say hello Dominic, right? In the in the uh, you know in your layout page, for example, then maybe it does make sense, right, to add login time 
retrieve the name of the user, right? And put that into the session here so that we have access to it. Maybe, you know, you have like really basic coarse grained authorization, like maybe, you know, like is, is he a user or an admin or whatever, right? Maybe that's something you wanna capture here as well. Um, as a side note, that is not meant to be a fully fledged authorization system. Yeah, so just in case you're wondering, should I now put all my permissions in there for that user? The answer is no. Um, of course, that session has, has to be uh, persisted somewhere, right? And by default, it's gonna be in a cookie. And, um, you know, cookie sizes are limited, right? So you should keep those cookies as small as possible. And if you wanna have like more fine-grained authorization system, there are better ways of doing that in ASP.NET. Don't put them into the session. Those, those um, you know, the permissions, whatever you wanna call them. Okay, anyways. So now that we have defined the identity of the user, yeah, right, uh, user ID, display name, and the fundamental, you know, user type, if you like, um, we're gonna create a so-called claims identity um, that captures those claims. Um, the claims identity is, it's a long story, but it, it, it's, it, it has, it, it has still several iterations. Um, to be successful with the, with the claims identity object, one thing you have to remember is you always have to use the constructor with four arguments, okay? The first argument is the claims. The second argument is what they call the authentication type, which is some metadata how that user has um, authenticated to your system. The third argument is which, which claim in that collection represents the name of the user. And the fourth argument is which claim in that collection represents the roles, if present, of that user. Okay, so that's how you become successful with this object. Um, and then you have to wrap the claims identity into a claims principle. So that's now ready to go. Now the question is, how do we now start this session? So to understand how this works is we have to have a little bit more knowledge about the underlying authentication system. So the thing is now we have all of these handlers in our DI system, but what you are not doing is, is somehow uh, resolve the cookie authentication handler from the DI container and start using it um, directly. Um, there is instead an abstraction on top that uh, you know basically uh, abstracts away all of the little differences between those uh, different authentication methods, and that is called the I authentication service okay so the i authentication service is a service in the di container and it gives you five fundamental methods um, we're going to have a look at every single one of them but um, the one we care about the most right now is how do we do session management right and there are two methods on this i authentication service which is called sign in and sign out and as you can see you pass in a claims principle you uh, pass in which uh, authentication handler should receive that that signal, if you like, and that's it, right? Um, that being said, typically you also don't use the I authentication service to talk to the authentication system. There's another abstraction on top of that, or if, if you like a convenience uh, API, which are basically extension methods on top of HP context, okay? So you see that there is a, um, a class that, that provides extension methods, sign in, sign out, they extend HP context and you can see that you can pass in the claims principle. What you can also see is, is that every of these extension methods here have two versions. One is with the scheme and one is without the scheme. And the idea here is, is that if you wanna explicitly invoke a, a specific authentication handler, you can pass in the name of that handler and they will internally figure out which you know concrete um, uh, implementation belongs to that name. Uh, or if you just omit the scheme name, um, the default scheme will be used, which is for these methods almost always what you want. Okay, so we're gonna um, look at, at, at the others in a second, but for now to fix our code, let's um, let's go here and say await HP context dot sign in async. Okay, and we're gonna pass in our claims principle, and since we are omitting the scheme name in this method. Internally, 
ASP.NET Core will go back to the configuration, look up what's the default scheme, that's cookie, and then will internally invoke whatever handler is named cookie, right? Which is then basically um, calling their sign-in implementation, which then this handler will, as the name implies, issue a cookie, okay? Um, right, now, once we have issued a cookie, we have to send the user back to the page that they you know, tried to access in the first place. And we have that information as part of the return URL uh, query string parameter that, that uh, was attached. So um, it's very tempting to do something like this, um, return URL, right? Which then ultimately will redirect the user back to whatever was on that query string parameter. So don't do that. That is um, uh, opening up your application for phishing attacks and uh, the vulnerability would be the open redirector um, attack. And the problem here is, is that you are blindly taking whatever value is on that return URL query string parameter and do a redirect, right? And how could, could, a, could an attacker uh, uh, exploit this? Basically, you know, imagine you're having, you, your company has a login page and somebody, f you know, sends emails to your users, right? And they say something like, hey, click here to win an Xbox or something like this, right? And that the URL they are clicking is something like, you know, your company, which is trusted by your users, right? Slash account, slash login, and then return URL would be something like HTTPS, uh, evil.com steal password, something like this, right? Uh, of, of course, the attacker would probably use something less obvious, but you know, that's the idea. And the way this, the, the way this attack would work is basically, you know, your, your, com your customer gets this email, they click the Xbox link because everybody wants to win an Xbox, right? Um, and then, and then they see a login page, right? They log in with name and password, which is correct. And then the, the login page re redirects them to evil.com to steal password, which happens to be a page which looks exactly like your login page, right? And, and it would say um, invalid name or password. And then um, the user would, you know, if they're not cautious enough, uh, retype their password and username and suddenly they have leaked their password to a third party, to the attacker, right? So yeah. This is how phishing attacks work, or at least very simple ones, right? So don't do this. So what you ultimately have to do is you have to um, validate the return URL and make sure this, this URL actually belongs to my own application. And this is actually not easy to do because there are so many ways how to encode and double encode and triple encode and so on um, URLs, right? So that you don't want to write this logic yourself. And fortunately, there is a way in ASP.NET Core um, to make sure that the return URL, you know, that, that only local URLs are being used here. And that is by using the local redirect method. Okay, um, cool. So while we are here, let's also implement a logout page. Okay, let's do add a new razor page here, call it logout. Um, and in here, we're going to make this uh, async task I action result, and then we can do, you know, the, 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 the nemesis of sign in, I guess, uh, it's called sign out. Um, and that will stop the session or again, you know, by virtue of calling the default scheme, which is the cookie, which then the sign out implementation of the cookie handler will delete the cookie again, which then ends the session and makes the user anonymous again. Okay. So let's go to um, our homepage here. Cool. So let's actually give this a try. Okay. So now we are here, right? And now we are logging in. Now, before I press the login button, um, let's have a look, or let me tell you what I expect to happen. Okay. So. We are pressing the login button, which posts back to our login page. We're going to create a claims principle, right? And then call sign in on that claims principle. Yeah, like exactly what we did here. Okay, so that will create that cookie um, and then set the, the response header. And then we are making a redirect, um, which basically is 
goes back to the browser and, and sends a, um, a 302 uh, to our return URL. So basically the, the browser makes, we're making a round trip back to the browser and, and on the next request, the browser will send this cookie that we have set in here, right? So the request comes into our application, meaning it will traverse our middleware pipeline, right? So it will uh, come here. Now the, the, the use of indication middleware, as I said earlier, is now basically responsible of, of looking at the incoming request and trying to find something which can be turned back into a user object, right? Into a claims principle. And that is basically the, the, the authentication middleware. And what the authentication middleware will actually call is the authenticate async method. Okay, so it basically will just say, hey, uh, try to authenticate. Okay, um, it will not pass in the scheme, so it will basically use the default scheme that is configured for your application, meaning we end up in the authenticate async method of the cookie handler, right? And then the, the cookie handler will now look at the incoming request, look at the cookie header, right? Take the cookie, validate the cookie, and if it's successful, it will return this authenticate result, which basically is a wrapper for a claims principle object and and, and some other things, okay? So, in other words, um, if we go here, click the login link, uh, we make a round trip, come back, and we should see a, a cookie called demo here, which contains our session data, and we should come back to our secure page, and what the secure page is actually doing is just rendering the claims of the currently logged on user, which should be exactly the same claims as we uh, added here when, when we issued the cookie. Okay, so let's try it. And here we are. Couple of things happened. We are on the secure page, right? The secure page is, is rendering our free claims that we just issued and we have a demo cookie. And that is uh, an encoded version of our session. And I'll talk about this in a second, what this actually is. Um, at the same time, we have a logout link here that goes to our logout page that we just created, which calls sign out again, right? And then goes back to our homepage, which means the cookie should be gone. Exactly, our demo cookie is gone. And the next time we're trying to access the protected resource, we are anonymous again, which means we have to re-authenticate, right? So log in, logged in, session cookie is there, log out, session cookie is gone, I'm logged out again. So we could do that now all day. Okay, so that's basically the, the, the basic um, session life cycle, if you will. Um, sign in starts the session, sign out stops the session, and at sign in time we can populate the session with certain data. There are other methods here on this um, um, on this iAuthentication service or uh, on the extension methods, right? So we've seen, for example, um, when the authorization middleware sees that the endpoint you're trying to access has this authorized attribute, but the user is anonymous, they're gonna call the challenge method on the default handler and the, the default implementation of the cookie handler will then go to the login page. We'll see the forbid method in uh, later on when we play around a little bit more with uh, authorization. Okay, um, as a side note, um, the session in ASP.NET can contain more than just claims and uh, um, don't confuse this with the, the session um, mechanism that you might know from ASP.NET or ASP.NET Core like the, like the shopping cart style session, right? This here is really, well, what I mean with this session here is the authentication session, yeah? And the authentication session basically lives you know, it basically starts when you call sign in and ends when you call sign out. And we've seen that you can pass in claims here, like the subject ID and the display name. Um, and another thing you can pass into the session is called authentication properties. And that is basically a, a dictionary of, you know, pretty much random key value pairs. And the idea is that if you want to, um, at, at a sign in time, uh, persist additional data, which are not claims, but still, data that belongs to the authentication session of the user. Um, if you want to do that, that's the way you can do this. And when you call sign out, this data will be gone, right? Um, actually, a very uh, um, popular approach is that, let's say you are collecting some sort of 
access tokens at sign in time, right? But maybe you want to call APIs at some later point. Where do you store these tokens? And in, in, instead of having to come up with your own storage mechanism, you can just put them into the session and then use them whenever you need to, as long as the session exists, right? And when you call sign out, when the session gets destroyed, these tokens get destroyed as well. That's um, a very common technique, for example, used by the OpenID Connect handler. Um, if you are asking for access tokens. Cool. So the next thing we have to talk about, with, because it's closely related to our, um, our session management, is when we are logging in, you see that demo cookie here. And I said this, this is like an encoded version of this session object, like the claims and uh, the authentication properties I just mentioned. Now, this data here is pretty sensitive, right? It might contain confidential data that you don't, you know, maybe your claims have some some con confidential data that you don't want anyone to see uh, besides the application. Um, and also you want to make sure that these claims cannot be changed or tampered with, right? Again, uh, what, what, what would happen if I, if I would be able to decode this blob here and change my subject ID or change my role, whatever, right? So in other words, this blob of data here must be protected somehow. And there's, there's an, um, a subsystem in ASP.NET Core, which is called the Data Protection API. And you know, in, an, in a nutshell, this, 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 that's a service living in a DI container and the idea is you, you give it some data and it returns you back a signed and encrypted version of that data. And then you can later on hand the signed and, and encrypted version of that data to the uh, service and they will validate it, make sure no one changed it and give you back the clear text version, right? So it's for round tripping secrets, yeah? Um, and that, that's exactly what's being used when you are issuing a cookie, right? So that cookie gets serialized in a binary format and then that, that format, that, 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 that blob of binary data gets passed on to the protection API and you get back a signed and encrypted blob of data that you can now safely send down to the browser. Uh, make sure you know that makes sure no one can change it no one can read it and when it comes back it gets validated and turned back into the original blob of data so round tripping a secret okay um why why am i mentioning that um this api is um for most parts invisible to a developer so uh, when you are running on your on your local developer machine and you run some application you will never ever you know know about this because under the covers they are just creating you know these the key material that that is needed for these operations and so on automatically for you you can see that key material like on a, on a windows machine for example when you go to your profile and you go to app data local asp.net and then there's a data protection keys um, 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 folder here or um, if you are on the mac for example and go um, to uh, uh, where is it uh, to, to your home directory right and uh, look at the, the hidden the hidden uh, folders here there's a dot asp.net there's a data protection keys folder with these files in there and these files are basically called key containers okay so um, so basically the key container is an xml file which um, contains the key material they use to um, protect and unprotect your data, right? So that is a, a pretty, an automated system. They do it automatically for you. You see there's a creation date, there's an uh, expiration date, so they also rotate those keys automatically for you. Um, it, it, you know, as I said, it, it's, it's, it's for most parts invisible. The only situation where it becomes very, very important to know about this mechanism is when you're deploying your applications into production, right? Um, because especially when you're doing a, when you're having a scale out scenario where your web farm or your cluster has more than one node running the same application, they need to share, of course, um, the, the location where they store that key material, right? So by default, it's on the local machine and that works fine for single server scenarios. But as soon as you have more than one server, you need to share that, um, share that location somehow and that always requires some manual intervention in, in my opinion yeah so for example if you're running on azure i prefer using the blob storage um, service to store my key container uh, if you're running on different cloud services you need to do that 
differently. Okay, so I'm making you aware of that. Um, you will run into this problem, I guarantee, yeah, if you are not taking explicit control over the key storage. Okay. Um, who is using that API? Well, cookies, I, I just mentioned that, like the authentication cookies and default tree protection is using it. Um, in OpenID Connect and OAuth, there's the state parameter, which, uh, you know, round trips data, which must be protected. Um, that, there's this temp data feature in, in Razor Pages. So if you're using any of those, you need data protection. Um, and um, you, you can also use it explicitly, like, like programmatically, if you have application data that you want to round trip, for example, or store, um, that only your application can consume that. That is what this API is for. Check out the documentation uh, at Microsoft's uh, website. They, they have extensive documentation how to configure the, the storage mechanism. And that's something you should do before you're, you're deploying to production. Good. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, authorization. So again, you know, there's much more to talk about when it comes to authentication and also for authorization. But as I said, A, this is a short version of our three day course and B, you know, uh, this video shouldn't become like too long, really. It, it you know, doesn't make sense. Anyways, um, the authorization system in ASP.NET Core, you know, um, is now around for a while because ASP.NET Core has been around for a while. But again, coming, looking back at what we had before in the old ASP.NET or the MVC, that there are, you know, lots of new features. Yeah, and um, I would encourage you to go to this uh, URL here on GitHub um, to the user called Blodart, which is uh, basically the uh, Barry Dorrance, who is the, the, the program manager at Microsoft who owns that authorization feature. And he wrote a much more in-depth um, uh, uh, workshop, hands-on lab style workshop, how to use the authorization APIs in ASP.NET Core. I'm just going to want to give you a, a quick introduction, um, especially how they interact with the authentication, right? Which is kind of important to understand. But for, from a high level point of view, um, there is a new authorization API. They made it look very similar to the old one for backwards compatibility, but there are much more features. And again, as everything now in, um, in uh, ASP.NET Core, it's something that lives in the DI container, very typically combined with some middleware. So we've seen the authorization middleware already. There's also a corresponding authorization service that lives in the DI system and um, and that's how you can programmatically do authorization. That's how the authorization middleware actually gets its job done, right? Um, and I would encourage you to just have a look at the authorization middleware source code, for example, to see how, how that works. Um, so if you remember in MVC, um, that's how that typically looked like, right? That's uh, the authorized attribute, as we've seen already. This still exists, as we've seen already. You can put the authorized attribute on a, on a controller or on a page, right? If you have um, multiple things below, you can allow anonymous to exclude certain things from authorization. And then there was this thing called role-based authorization, where you could say like, okay, this action result, or this, this action can only be invoked if the user is member of the sales role. Now, I didn't like this ever. Yeah, I think it's very bad style to do, to do this style of authorization, especially with the roles. It leads to, um, you know, tight coupling between role names and business logic. And, you know, this might all work very well if you have like five controllers, but if you're writing a real application, let's say you have 50 controllers or 500, right? This becomes um, a mess. So um, this would still work. As I said, it is designed to be backwards compatible, but what really is the new style in uh, ASP.NET Core authorization is what is called policy-based authorization. And the idea is, is that instead of going to your business logic endpoint and say like, who is allowed to do what, you rather um, wrap that up in reusable policies. Yeah. So for example, here you see that we are creating a policy called manage customers. And we define, okay, to be able to manage a customer, you need to be authenticated. You need to have a claim of type department with value of sales. You need to have a claim of type status with value of senior, right? And then you attach this policy to the endpoint, right? And we've already seen that um, 
we, how that works, right? By, by using the authorized attribute or by using um, the, the require authorization extension method. And this works exactly the same. So let's just copy um, this policy to our application, right? For example, here, um, builder dot, um, dot services, right? So now we have this uh, manage customers authorization policy. And now if we want to ensure that everyone who's using my application fulfills this policy here, manage customers, we could, for example, um, attach it here and just say manage customers. Okay. Um, or what is my preferred way of doing it is just put um, a global require authorization on the endpoints, meaning now all of your pages need an authenticated user. So in case of somebody adds a new page, they can't forget to add the authorized attribute there, right? And then go to, for example, um, your index page here and say, okay, the, 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 the index page allows anonymous access, okay? So, but all the other pages don't. Well, actually also your login page should allow anonymous access, otherwise it becomes hard to log in, right? Um, like this, for example, okay, cool. Um, and now we can actually remove the authorized attribute here because it is protected by default, right? So if I now run my application again, we should see the same behavior as before, right? So let's go here, right? So I removed the authorized attribute, but still I need to log in because there's now a global authorization requirement and this works, this works as before, great, okay? Um, now let me do this. Let's create a second page here called Secure2, okay? Uh, a razor page, Secure2. And on this page here, I want to, for example, um, attach our specific authorized policy called Manage Customers, okay? So if I now run this again, you see, um, if I log in here, right, I'm logged in, but what would happen if I go to secure two, right? Do I fulfill the requirements um, of, 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 of that page? Do I have all these claims? No, I don't. So what, what is ASP.NET now supposed to do, right? And that's the last m moving part here that you need to understand is that there is a concept of a forbidden result. Okay, so in other words, ASP.NET Core cannot do anything now here. Uh, I would not be allowed to access Secure2, so what should they do? Well, either you programmatically catch this or the last resort would be to go to, uh, you know, like you are not allowed page, you know, right? Re call, you know, uh, contact your administrator, right? And that's what they call the um, access denied path. Okay, so I, I already have an access denied page. Um, in my application, so let's call this access denied, okay? So what, what does my access denied page do? Well, not a lot. It says access denied, okay? So if I now run this again um, and go to the secure two page, you see now I'm getting access denied, yeah? Now, this is an interesting little detail here. Um, and that's why uh, I said, uh, we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna talk about the last method a little bit later. You see that there are the five methods. We know what sign in does, we know what sign out does. Now challenge is now, as I, as I said earlier, if the user is anonymous, challenge brings the user to a place where they can log in to fix the problem, right? And that, as we've seen, is the method that brings us to the login page. Forbid, on the other hand, is basically for a situation where the user is already authenticated, but they are still trying to access something they are not allowed to, right? Going back to the login page and forcing the user to log in again will not fix that problem because, you know, he's, he will still not be allowed afterwards, yeah? And that these are the two states of unauthorized. Challenge means you can maybe fix that by logging in. Forbid means you can't, so you have to, you know, do something else. Yeah. And again, back in the old days in ASP.NET, this didn't exist, this, this distinction. So you ended up very often on the login page writing some code to say like, okay, if you are anonymous, show the login page. If you are logged in, 
do something else, right? And that is now baked into the system, right? So, in other words, if I now run the application again, and I would not go to secure, but I will directly go to um, uh, secure two, okay? Um, now, when I run this uh, or hit enter here now, I will enter my application. The offer, you know, the, the 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 authentication middleware will say the user is anonymous. Okay, the authorization middleware will say, hey, there there's an authorization requirement here, so we must authenticate. Yeah, so that means they're gonna call challenge first, send me to the login page. I'm gonna log in now, but when I hit enter here or log in, it will go back to secure two, which will still fail. So they won't bring me back to the login page, but then to the access denied page. Okay, and of course you can catch these errors or you know, you could be more defensively or you know, you could um, uh, on, the, on the secure two page not do it declaratively, but rather call the authorization service programmatically and if that fails, send them to a different page. You know, there are multiple ways of doing that, but um, it all boils down to a certain state machine here, which is basically the, the interplay between the authentication middleware and the authorization middleware. Good. So. Um, yeah, which basically brings me to my last slide, which is maybe the most important one and that, that, that's the one you should remember. And that is basically, as I said, um, that's how the state machine works. Okay, so let's walk you through that step by step. So the browser sends a request, then the authentication middleware sits in the pipeline. It figures out what is my default authentication scheme and transfers control to that. The default authentication scheme then calls authenticate async to try to authenticate something on the incoming request, which in our case would be a cookie, right? Um, if that was successful, um, they would populate hpcontacts.user. So from this point on, you have a user property that you can use, right? In your business logic or which is the, the, the next step in the authorization middleware, right? If there is no cookie found or that um, validation was unsuccessful, you know, then there will be no user and at this point the, the request will just be anonymous. Yeah. So the next step would be probably to resolve the endpoint, check the authorization middle, middle um, sorry, the authorization metadata. Then the uh, authorization middleware will check is there an authorization metadata attached to it or a policy, right? And if that's not the case, we will gonna execute the endpoint. If that is the case, the, the authorization middleware will check now, is there a, a currently logged on user or is the request anonymous? If the request is anonymous, then they will call the challenge method on the authentication handler, which will then ultimately do a redirect to the login page, which means the whole thing starts over. And this time we, we're going to the login page, okay? If there is a policy attached to that, um, uh, 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 metadata, then the, the, the policy gets executed and if that um, uh, is successful or unsuccessful uh, rather, um, the middleware calls for bit and then it will um, send us to the X-denied path. If the uh, evaluation of the policy was successful, then the, ex the endpoint gets executed. Okay, so that is the summary of that hopefully short video. Um, and that is basically how the authentication and authorization system works together in ASP.NET Core if you are using the middleware and the declarative approach. Of course, this all can be customized in any shape or form you like by writing code, but that is the default behavior. So I hope that was useful. Um, and uh, that this gives you kind of like a, a better idea what the missing pieces are, or, or, or the, the moving parts are rather, I should say. Um, I would encourage you, you know, go to the ASP.NET Core repo, have a look at the source code of the authentication middleware. You will be amazed. It's, I think the whole thing is just 60 lines of code, including comments and namespaces and, and so on. It, it's a simple logic, yeah? Have a look at the authorization middleware, which is a little bit more complicated, but still not hard to follow. Um, but having a, a good understanding how the default system works to protect your application is crucial. Okay, thank you.